Welcome to our broadcast. Tonight, film director Oliver Stone. His new film is Heaven and Earth. Also the former chairman of Bloomingdale's Marvin Trab, And we will have the owners of four great restaurants here to talk about the restaurant business. The owner of 21, Four Seasons, Le Cirque, and the Russian Tea Room. We begin with Oliver Stone. He is one of Hollywood's most controversial directors. He may be America's ultimate revisionist filmmaker. He forced the nation to take a new look at history with landmark films such as Platoon, Born on the Fourth of July, and JFK. In his latest work, Heaven and Earth, he tells his true story of a Vietnamese peasant survival during and after the war. And for the first time, an Oliver Stone film is built around a woman. We're pleased to have Oliver Stone join us for a conversation about his film and his career. Welcome. Thank you, Charlie. It's great to have you here. This is a new, tell me about the beginning of the film. I mean, it, it's now, it is now described as a trilogy from Platoon to Born on the Fourth of July to this film. But when you began Platoon, uh, did you have any notion that you wanted to do three films about Vietnam? No, I never, I never would have expected to do a film about a, a boy in a wheelchair or yeah. a, a Vietnamese peasant woman. It just, I wasn't interested in that. In, Ten years ago, it would have seemed impossible to me. I think each film took me to another place. It's, uh, I stretched in a way and I became more interested in other people. And I think I had to go through my own story first, in a way, before I got interested in Ron's story or in uh, Lely's story. And what brought you to this story? And why did you think um, well, it after was doing, important, after, based on two novels? I mean, yeah. two, two books. Well, after I did Ron Kovic's movie, which was really about the return home after Vietnam with the people who came back to this country, I felt that to complete the sort of experience, the eyewitness experience, it, it, was, uh, it was necessary to really do the Vietnamese side of the war, what they suffered. Because our suffering, I think, can only really be measured by what they suffered. So I read, uh, I read the, the, the first book by Le Lee, Heaven, When Heaven and Earth Changed Places, and I was really moved by the, the raw and the naive experience that she had. She had a life. I mean, she, she, if, if life is a roulette wheel, uh, she hit every ticket on the roulette wheel. Uh, she was a, a peasant. She was a, a, a spy. She was tortured. Spy she for was, the Viet Cong. She was a spy for the Viet Cong. She was tortured by the government uh, side. She was uh, raped. She was a, a mistress of a rich man in Saigon. She was uh, a, 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 a beggar in the streets. She was a, a prostitute. Married three times. She became an American housewife. She was married to three, twice and had three children with three different men and she was also a very astute American businesswoman. She fought back. I mean, she was not a, the typical victim by any means. She was a fighter and a warrior. She won my respect as, a, as I met her. She took me back to Vietnam uh, several times. I went to her village. She inculcated in me a, a respect for, for Vietnamese life. She taught me agriculture, which I didn't know. I mean, to go back to a understand what we as infantry soldiers, when we walked through those villages, we walked right through the rice paddies. We destroyed the shrines. We, we destroyed the houses. We did not understand that the land is an integral and spiritual part of the Vietnamese experience, that growing rice is a spiritual activity, that they bury their ancestors in next to the rice fields because uh, the spirit of the ancestors uh, lies over the entire village. So when they ingest the rice, they eat the rice, it's also an act of worship they're ingesting, in, in, in a sense, the spirit of the ancestors. Much has been made in terms of talking about you, that this is a film about a woman, and much has been made about the other films that you have made. It, was this in any way a leap for you? Was this an effort for you to reach in and find a different yeah. side of you to tell this absolutely, story? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, how so? Tell me. Well, a woman per se, I, it, let's say that Lei Li, by playing all these roles in her life, she wore all these masks in itself suggests a, a, a tremendous uh, fluidity of, of character. Uh, I think a woman, in a sense, is more like water. And I think sometimes, to be simplistic, I think men can be a bit like rock or a little bit rigid. And I think that through Lei Li, I was able to understand, uh, first of all, the, the Buddhist law that life is truly change things change, everything changes for Lely. And where she was able to survive against her adversity was in her ability to change and her ability to adapt to change. So she survived and she grew and her spirit grew. And at the end of the day, she was able to forgive the men who had hurt her, the people who had betrayed because her. Because of her faith. 
because, because of because of her faith. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. is this what brought you, or was it early on, brought you to Buddhism yourself? This well, experience let, let's just was say that uh, you know I. Uh, I've always been exposed to the East and, since yeah. I was 18 years and, old. And Asia has always <coughs> been a special fascination for you. But I never really understood uh, Lely's uh, faith until I was there. I mean, when you see it, it works on a daily basis. It's not like something you'd go to on a Sunday to a church. You know, you're mm -hmm. there every day. You, you, you live it. You feel it. The monks are, are part of the landscape. Uh, you are, uh, Buddhism is really awareness. It's, it's a heightened awareness of everyday life, whether it's breathing, eating, uh, praying, meditating. So are you a Buddhist? You're asking me another question. I'm talking about okay. Lili now. No, no. All uh, right, but go ahead, because I mean, it, 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 we're also interested in you and your own experience yeah. and, and in describing well, how it had helped her survive and it had been uh, the, the capacity to change yeah. and the capacity to forgive came from, in yeah. part, she the fact she was Buddhist. Tremendous compassion in this woman Trem uh, and a belief in the spirit world, worship of ancestors. Yeah. Uh, worship of her family, and I think that she had a, th a lot to teach me, and I, and I think she, I think the Vietnamese have a lot to teach Americans because, uh, whereas let's say we suffered sixty thousand dead in the war, they they lost a million to two million people, they have more than a hundred thousand uh, missing in action. I mean their scope of suffering was much more enormous than ours. So, in a sense, by being able to go back there and live her experience, I was able to understand and put our suffering into perspective. All right, don't want to let the point go, though. Ha has it changed your Absolutely. religion? And have you become a Buddhist? Well, I mean, why is that a hard question? Well, I, because uh, it, it's, it smacks of organized religion, and I, th and I think I have to emphasize to you that Buddhism, to me, is not an organized religion. Organized religion is for people who are, are scared of hell. I think spirituality are, are for, is for people who have been to hell. And I think that Buddhism doesn't make any claims to, to be organized, whereas you can be a Christian, you can believe in Jesus, you can believe in God, Western God, a concept of, as I do, and you can also practice awareness, you can practice Buddhism, you can also be a Jew and practice Buddhism. It's not exclusive. I do have a problem... So, so you can believe if, in the tenets of Buddhism <laughs> and correct. the philosophy of Buddhism without necessarily somehow it's just going through some ritual of becoming right. something. It's Is not that arcane, point? it's not mystic, it's very... T it's, it's, it's simply awareness. Uh, I do have a problem with original sin, uh, I, I, which is... You're against it. I do have a problem with it, and I, I think that it's a Western concept, and I think uh, in the East they say uh, uh, babies are born happy. You yeah. see it on their faces, they yeah. smile. Uh, so part of the purpose of life is to preserve the happiness. So uh, let's say concepts of Western guilt are, are, are difficult for me. I will go that far, and that's part of the reason I made the Jim Morrison movie, because he seemed to me to be a creature that was avo uh, not avoiding, but uh, let's say running from uh, any fear or guilt. And mm -hmm. I, I do have a problem with that. What is it about this story that you think will be attractive to audiences? I think it's a story ultimately about any adversity that we face. I mean, it's a spiritual odyssey. It's a anyone who faces disease, who faces, even in peacetime there are a adversity. Of, yeah, it's about your spirit. What do you do with your, how do you deal with life? How do you react to life and all the problems that life brings? This woman has seen all degrees of suffering, has seen uh, all the sides of men, has carried with her much man hatred. There's a monk in the film who accuses her also of having man hatred. And you, let me talk about the casting a little second. You found um, a young woman to play Lele, who had not acted ever, ever, uh, never been in a high school she, play or anything. She came either with herself or with a friend to a, a, an open opportunity uh, to yeah, meet with yeah. representatives of the film. Were you there? No, I was not at the first audition. Yeah. We auditioned 16, 18,000 Vietnamese all over the country. Yeah. We sent out uh, casting crews, put them on tape. She walked in, and uh, the casting people were thought Locked she has charisma. Yeah. And put her on tape, flew her to Los Angeles. I met her. She walked in the room. She was spectacular. She was about four foot eleven, ninety, ninety-five pounds. But she had a great beauty about her. She had beautiful eyes. She had a great spunk and spirit. She'd been a boat person. Yeah. She and grew up in a poor family here in America. Her family had at that time was on welfare. And she had this wonderful smile. She just encompassed the room with that smile. It wasn't too hard to uh, follow up with that and 
we tested her and tested her many times on video and on film. We put her in uh, with Joan Chen and with Tommy Lee Jones, Joan who Chen. was about three right. times her size, He's, and, uh, the, and Hang Noor the, from the Killing Fields. Right. And uh, they were professional, and they helped bring her up. We were nervous. We, we, the whole film rides on her shoulders. Sure. And she performs magnificently. We went out to Asia and we started shooting and we kept our fingers crossed. Yeah. Set this film up. It's a uh, Don't Want a New Boyfriend. That's, what is this clip that we're going to see? Oh, this is uh, halfway through the movie. She meets uh, her, she's in Saigon and she's working as a hostess in a Korean bar. And she meets Tommy Lee Jones, who is a GI on the street. And he follows her home and he tells her. He just, he's, he's persistent, and he wants to meet her, and he wants to talk to her. She doesn't really want to meet him because she doesn't like men at this point of her life. Roll tape, here it is. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones, it worked with him, he played Clay Shaw in JFK. First lead, first romantic lead, uh, as far as you know? Well, since uh, Coal Miner's Daughter, when yeah. he was with Sissy, yeah, right. this, is a, this is a role for him where... What is it about he's him tender. that somehow... He's an interesting character. He's, uh, he's a bit like America itself in Vietnam. I mean, he's reaching out to help her. He wants to meet an Oriental wife, and he, he marries her. He brings her back to San Diego, and it looks like it's going to be a happy ending. And uh, things are tough in America. It's sort of like what... I'm, you know, when, you're, when Americans were in Vietnam, they were a bit of a... We were big shots, and then a lot of us, when we came back uh, to civilian life, were nothing. And I think that Tommy goes through that change and financial frustration in the States. And I think he represents a lot of what Vietnam veterans went through back here. And I'm not going to tell you the ending, but it does get very complex. You filmed this in Thailand. <coughs> Thailand, uh, yes. you, you didn't, you put a documentary crew in Vietnam to shoot some... Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have quite a few landscape shots from Vietnam, about 20, 30 shots are in, from beautiful uh, yeah. shots of... Why didn't you shoot it in Vietnam? because it's so beautiful. It's an amazing looking place. They, no, we, why didn't you oh, shoot couldn't this shoot, film uh, in Vietnam? Well, Rather, why'd you shoot it in Thailand? There's two problems. There's a United States embargo still 20 years after the war. So you couldn't Vietnam. have shot it, the United States would not have No, and also the Vietnamese you. government objected, uh, to be honest, to two or three sensitive uh, moments where Le Lee's book is critical of the Viet Cong. So uh, there is politically, there was hardliners on both sides in America and in Vietnam. Yeah. There was also raised in some of the stuff that I read uh, some fear that there would be people who would bear such uh, remembrance of pain that the war had brought to them that they... I don't think so. I think that the, what the movie is about healing and it's about moving on and forgiving your enemy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the, uh, that's what Lely's message is and I hope people who see the film understand that. If, there are people who are going to see it, they're going to be hardline, and they're going to say that's, uh, they're going to become angry in both countries, in America and in Vietnam. So, uh, but I hope, I think the majority of people will see this as a healing film. By this film, do you complete your, your sense of what you wanted to say about Vietnam? I, I completed, uh, let's say, the personal eyewitness testimony that I've been, that I, I'm from all three sides, Ron Kovic, my own, and, and mm. I think that there, there's, you know, you can do a big, the macro yeah. picture of what the uh, commanders were going through, what the politics were. See, Vietnam to me, they keep saying, you know, it's why are you so obsessed? It's not like I am that obsessed, I don't think. I do feel that Vietnam is a state of mind. It's not a piece of history only, it's a state of mind because it's about America intervening in, in third world countries. It's about America being a global cop, not, use, not working with the United Nations, just going in and intervening and not knowing the country that you're intervening in not understanding the, the local spiritual values or culture, whether it be Mogadishu or Panama or Vietnam. This thing is going to go on and on. We've had six or seven interventions since Vietnam. Speaking of that, you're making a film about Noriega? Yeah. 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 With Al Pacino in the lead, yeah. playing Noriega? Yeah, looks when like it. Go ahead. <clears throat> it looks like we go next uh, May yeah. in uh, Panama. Uh, essentially an autobiography, I mean a biographical not really. It's more uh, the last couple of years of, of uh, the regime when things got crazy, and uh, it really uh, is satiric in, in tone. It's not quite like the investigative JFK movie. It's more yeah. satire. Well, speaking of JFK, it's inevitable to come to that when you have an interview with you and a conversation with you. Any regrets you have now? I mean, boy, it, would, it brought a ton of attention on you. Um, both sides jumped on you. People rose to your defense. People jumped on you. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I, I still think, for me, it's one of my best.
best films. It's one of it, I, I always felt like it's more of a philosophical film. It's about reality and who owns it and how we perceive it, as opposed to being a political statement. It never I always positioned it as a counter myth because I, I said we don't have all the facts, and I never claimed to know who, who, who. You know, I believe that Garrison has a very strong point of view, and I happen to agree with it. But I think the film he is. He just died, did he? He just remember? died. Yeah. yeah. But I think the film is framed as his point of view. It's not like all the perceptions in the film come from his mind. And I think sometimes people I don't think that jumped on it as if it, jumped on it as if it had were trying to be an objective truth. It was not set out to be. This was just the truth as Jim Garrison saw it in yeah. your mind. In and your mind, that's what you were shooting. Absolutely. Jim Garrison's truth. And my own, too, but I was behind it. But I, yeah. I framed it as Jim's. So you believed as Jim Garrison did, essentially. I believe in most of what Jim said. There are some things that you know one can dispute. But essentially, it's my perception, too. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, it was set up as a counterattack on, on an established Warren Commission an alternative that had existed for, for 30 years and was being well sold on television and in magazines. We didn't have time to present the Warren Commission side mm -hmm. of the argument. So, what's happening, though, it seems, and almost as an aftermath of JFK, with case closed and with other things that have stepped forward, pe more and more people seem to be coming, and tell me if you think this is wrong, to, to accept the Warren Commission. That's not true at all. On the contrary, uh, there's I'm been an orgy of media attention given to the uh, Oswald did it alone theory, and it's sort of invaded our national, you know, it's been like the, pol the political party line in the media for the 30th anniversary, which we all saw this coming. Right. But you, you, you have political to know. party line for the 30th anniversary of the shooting yeah. was that uh, Oswald did it yeah. alone. But and you, who's you, the party you line of what? Well, of all networks, uh, front line of Newsweek, of Time. But you have to notice. Why is that, that a party line, Oliver? Why is that not just their own investigative because they process never led them to that conclusion? Because if you read these things, through and through. They set up all the counter arguments as straw men. They knock down any uh, conspiracy type argument. They, they ridicule it and they don't even give it full weight. And uh, this, this ran the gamut from the networks through the, uh, through the magazines. And case closed the book? Case closed is the prosecutor's argument for the, for the case. He never even used the defense argument very well. He didn't, for example, his computer model, he used the uh, Failure Analysis Bureau's prosecution of Oswald. He never even entered into the realm of the defense. So, you know, he only used one side of the argument. Uh, there's so much overlooked evidence, and uh, it, hasn't, it was not dealt with in this 30th anniversary. Tell me, you've had an uh, extraordinary career uh, after screenplays from Scarface and, and Salvador, who came out in 1986, your first directorial effort. 1986. I mean, it seems to me when you look at Wall Street and you look at uh, Born on the Fourth of July, and you look at Platoon. I mean, help me out. The number of films you have made in seven years. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where? How have you changed? Uh, how? Where do you think you're going in your own head? And, and did this latest film, because you, it was a different film. It was a. I've grown. I've grown. I mean, I could not have made this movie uh, seven years ago, eight years ago. The more, let's say, I've just matured. I see the other side of the equation more often. I'm more empathetic to other people. Uh, a woman's story is something I probably could not have done yeah. a few years ago. You're close to your mother, very, very, Jacqueline yeah, Stone, yes. you know, who lived in Paris. Did, was that part of the equation of this film? I mean, well, she's always been saying to me that I should. She always wanted to make uh, me uh, me to do uh, Gone with the Wind, you know. And, yes, right. Uh, she, Clark Gable was. She her, introduced uh, you to movies because of her. She always used to take me to the movies when I was a child. But uh, uh, I could. Uh, she, why don't you ever make a love story? You know, she said. And, and you I, would say what? I'm not I said, yet I'm ready. I'm not ready for it, but I think with heaven and earth, it's about as close as I could get. Yeah. To, uh, but after this, the next two films are, one is about violence with Tommy Lee Jones in the lead, right? Uh, natural the Born Killers. Natural Born Killers. Yeah. And also Noriega, which is certainly about violence. Yes, they're different. You know, right. uh, I, I made Heaven and Earth and I feel very good about it. And I mean, uh, I'm, I, you know, I don't want to, I don't like to repeat the same mood necessarily right yeah. away. I'd like to go back and I'm actually exploring with Noriega and Natural Born Killers uh, more an element of comedy and, and uh, satire. Yeah, you also, Evita, you're going to write to the screen. Evita is a very strong woman's film. Right. Uh, and I, I've always, I've been fascinated by that character for years. And you believe that there's a real demand for films that are essentially driven by female character, that there is a market oh, yeah, out there, sure. all those people who sure. say that, that women in the lead can't carry a film, don't That's understand the nature of America and the world. and, yeah. and 
No, no, we've I mean, the, the power he, of good stories. Also, you <laughs> produced Joy Luck Club, I should say. We produced Joy Luck Club and the tradition of movies from, from Garbo and uh, Mary Pickford and uh, Betty Davis, Catherine Hepburn. I mean, there's uh, Joan Crawford. There's, there's a strong tradition of, of females in film, and I think that. I think the film business is really kind of booming and it's a golden age and people are going to be making more and more of this. I thank you as we go out. I want to cancel the audience at home to see another uh, clip from Heaven and Earth. Oliver Stone, the writer, the director, and the producer. My pleasure. Thank Great you, to have you. Thanks. Roll tape. <laughs>